Hey guys, I'm Georgia and today I'm going to tell you about 10 books that I have read most recently. I love making these videos so much. I love talking about each and every book I read and giving you my thoughts and opinions and my review because what is the point in reading a book if you can't talk about it? And I haven't got many bookish friends. I've got a couple but they don't really tend to read the same genre as I do. So you guys are pretty much my only book friends and we're going to talk about it. Of course this is going to be like relatively spoiler free and might accidentally let like little storyline things go but no big spoilers here, nothing huge, nothing's going to like ruin the enjoyment of a book for you. And I tell you what, we've actually got a really good selection of books today, not a single one of these did I particularly dislike. I've got one that I was like meh on, the rest of them are good. So this is going to be a very positive 10 books I've read recently video, let's get into it. So the first book I've got for you is Gillian Flynn's Dark Places. I feel like I've already spoken about this so much on my channel because I read this ages ago now, but here is my full review. So this is the last book I had to read in like the Gillian Flynn trilogy. It's not a trilogy, she's just written three books and now I've read all three of them. And this is my least favourite, but that does not mean I didn't enjoy it. Like this is a solid like three and a half, maybe four stars. It was a really solid book. So this is a story of Libby Day and she is a very messed up woman and if there's one thing Gillian Flynn does well in her writing amongst a million other things it's writing messed up women. She really can get into like the psychology, she makes all these layers, she's just so good at writing women and so many authors are so so bad at it. Gillian Flynn is so good but particularly like dark women she's really good at it. So Libby Day is a very messed up character but she has good reason because it transpires that when she was just seven years old she was the sole survivor of a family massacre on which her older brother, her 15 year old brother Ben, was blamed and sent to prison. So she has spent her whole life thinking her older brother Ben killed their entire family and for some reason she was spared. She ran away and she survived. And Libby's just always taken for granted that it was her brother that did this, like she's never had any contact with him, he was the one responsible. Libby's now an adult, she's running out of money and she realises that she can make the most of true crime enthusiasts and sell things that were in the famous, the infamous Day Family Massacre home. And so she starts to sell these things and gets in contact with this one guy who like opens her eyes to this whole world of true crime. She goes to all these conventions, she basically starts talking to all these people who know a lot more about her own family's case than she does. And she learns through this that there's a lot of reason to think that Ben might actually be innocent. And that's basically the story, you're trying to figure out is Ben innocent of this or not and it's sort of told through flashbacks, so Libby's own flashbacks to when she was a child in the house, Ben's flashbacks, her mum's flashbacks and you're kind of piecing together the story really really slowly throughout the book and the ending of this is fantastic. The only reason I give it like three and a half stars is I don't think it's as tight as Gillian Flynn's other writing, I think this was her first one and I think you can kind of tell that. And you can very much tell as well the sort of influences that Gillian Flynn has pulled from for this. It's very, very, very reminiscent of the Clutter Family murders, so Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. Gillian Flynn also talks a lot about the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s. I am fascinated by the satanic panic, I find it such an interesting period of history and so obviously I love that aspect of the book as well. If there's one thing Gillian Flynn does really really well in her writing, it's writing messed up women but like making them like three-dimensional multi-layered characters and there's a reason behind everything but they're still messed up. It's just so good. And then let's just completely completely switch up the genres with Written in the Stars by Alexandria Belfleur. This is not a psychological thriller murder mystery, this is sapphic rom-com. I love this book so much, it's so fluffy and light-hearted and stupid at points and the smut, oh my god, the smut in this is like the best I've ever read in my life, it was so good. And this is a very classic trope where it's two people pretend to be dating but then actually fall for each other in the process, like it's a very very overdone trope and if it's done badly, it's done very very badly but if it's done right, this is what you get. You've got Elle who's this like quirky free astrologer, she's very like hippy dippy, believes in all like this astrology stuff and then you've got Darcy who's this, what is her job actually? Actuary? She's an actuary, couldn't tell you for life of me what an actuary is, I can't remember but it's a very boring corporate kind of job and Darcy's very like serious in all the ways that Elle is very like quirky and weird 
So they're set up on a date by Darcy's brother and immediately they do not hit it off. They do not like each other at all and it's very, very, very clear. But they're very attracted to one another. And then Darcy ends up lying to her brother. She just wants her brother to get off her back and she's like, yeah, we hit it off really well. We're going on another date. Like it's all going really well. And they end up, for reasons that you'll find out if you read the book, pretending to be in a relationship. And it's very up and down, very roller coastery. But of course, real feelings do develop. It's such a cliche, but it's so well done. Like this is a romance. Like it's a rom-com, there's comedy as well, but like the romance in this just felt so real. And what I really loved about this as well, like it's sapphic, it's a love story between two women. But it's not a coming out story. There's no like existentialism, no trauma. Like both the women are accepted by their families, who they are, like whatever. It's just a story about their love. And I really liked it. And I do know there are two others in this series, uh, Hang the Moon and I can't remember what the other one is called, but I do want to read the rest of them. But I don't think the rest of them are actually sapphic. I don't think they're about these two same characters, which puts me off a little bit. If anybody's read them, let me know what you think. Next up, we have a book that I actually read on my Kindle, and that is The Catch by TM Logan. Now, I actually read The Holiday by TM Logan last year, and I really, really enjoyed it. So when I saw this, I'm pretty sure this was on Kindle Unlimited, another one by TM Logan, I was like, yay, I liked his last book, let me pick this one up. And you know what? This one just wasn't as good. It was fine-ish. It wasn't great. Like when I was writing my notes for this video, I couldn't remember what this book was about. And I think that says everything you need to know. But it transpires that this is a book about a dad who meets his daughter's fiance for the first time and immediately hates him. Like immediately bad vibes, don't like him. But the fiance obviously seems to be the perfect man. He's charming and handsome and funny and like does everything he can to win over the dad. But the dad is just like, no, bad vibes. And you spend the whole book trying to like figure out if the dad is crazy or if he's actually got a point. But it's really hard because everything this character does is absolutely insane. Like nothing really happens for 90% of this book. It's just this dad like slowly losing his marbles, convincing himself that his daughter's fiance is a serial killer villain. Like he breaks into his house. He like photocopies his like files and like all these weird things to the point where the dad is actually coming across as the villain because of course he is coming across as insane. Um, but then you find out what's really going on and no spoilers, but it's weird. In all honesty to me, this book just came across as quite misogynistic. It was like a dad and a fiance fighting over the daughter and the daughter never got any say in anything that happens really. Like she was just a secondary character and really if it was about her, I think it would have been a lot more interesting. But it's just these two men fighting about the daughter's affection. It's, I don't like it, didn't like it. If you're gonna read T.M. Logan, read The Holiday. That one is fantastic. Sorry, the lighting here is switching up so much. It's driving me a little bit mad, but the sun is just going in that clouds. And you know what? I can't control the weather as much as I'd like to. Next up we have If You Still Recognize Me by Cynthia So. This is another sapphic book, but this time it's YA. It's just cute sapphic fluff. So the protagonist here is a character called Elsie. She's a teenage girl and she's like a big old nerd. She's big into the world of fandom and she is obsessed with this anime show. I'm sure it's anime. I can't remember what it's called for the life of me. But she's obsessed with this anime show and she's very deep into this world online. And she's made loads of friends through this online world. Um, she's very big on Tumblr. It's like a lot of basis around Tumblr, which is really funny to me because I was such like a 2010 Tumblr kid. Through this world, Elsie's met Ada. Now Elsie lives in the UK and Ada lives in New York and Elsie has such a crush on Ada. She is obsessed with her. She's all she thinks about. They talk all day, every day. And it very much seems like Ada also has a crush on Elsie, but you don't know because they've never really met and they're just talking via text all day and things get misconstrued. But it very much seemed like Ada did like Elsie, I'm just saying. But then a span is thrown in the works when Elsie's old childhood best friend called Joan comes back from Hong Kong. And it's very, very clear that Joan is a big old lesbian. Elsie herself is Asian, her family are Chinese, and there's a lot of conversations in this book around like queerness and fitting in, but also like queerness at the intersection of like culture, like being Chinese and how that all works. If you read Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe, which I've recommended a million times on this channel, so if you haven't read it, 
why? Why have you not read it? I think if you read that first, you'll have a much deeper understanding of the sort of themes at play here. I don't feel like this book does as good a job as delving into it as Last Night at the Telegraph Club does, but this is cute YA fluff and Last Night at the Telegraph Club is just adult fiction, so it makes sense. There is like one recurring storyline throughout this, like not the main storyline, but just like an underlying storyline that made me cringe every time it was brought up. It literally made me want to die. And I found myself having to remind myself multiple times throughout this process that this is YA. I'm 28 years old, I am not its target audience. <laughs> but if you are a teenager reading this, if you are a YA reading this, I think you would have a lot more appreciation for it than I did. But it was just really cute. <laughs> Yerba Buena by Nina Lacour. This was sold to me as adult sapphic fiction. I would say it leans more towards just being like lit fic or contemporary fiction. The sapphic thing in this book really takes a back seat. Like both of the main characters in this are gay women, but that's not a main plot point. Although talking of plot, this didn't have much of a plot. This is definitely more of a character driven book. If you're into that kind of thing, you will absolutely love this. I do struggle a bit with character driven books. I did really like this. I gave this four stars, so let that speak for it's itself. itself. Um, so this is a story of two women, Sarah and Emily, and they're completely separate, never met, but their lives are kind of running parallel to each other. It follows Sarah as she runs away from home when she's 16 and moves to California and goes out on her own. And it also follows Emily as she does something very similar. She's growing up in California and trying to go out in the world on her own and figure out stuff and you've got these like two characters running parallel and they never meet and they become so close at certain points to meeting and it just never happens well it does happen eventually but for okay my camera ran out and i have no idea where i was but i know i was talking about this book so i'm just gonna keep talking and hope that it kind of matches up i think it literally cut me off mid-sentence so apologies <laughs> So in this story you've got Sarah who had a really hard life growing up and she is just trying to improve herself. She's removed herself from a very traumatic situation and she's now trying to remove herself from the world of drugs and abuse and is trying to make herself stronger. Rhubarb has just climbed into the cupboard. <laughs> That's my cat by the way. And then you've got Emily who's trying to discover herself and her heritage. So you've got two women who are sort of like destined to be together, that's what you feel throughout the entire book. But they're very, very different and they're dealing with very different problems. Like Sarah's trying to escape family whilst Emily's trying to connect with hers and it's a really poignant juxtaposition. I usually really struggle with character study type books but I did really like this one. I think because I really liked and really felt for both the characters. This isn't quite sapphic fiction, it's not quite lit fic, it's not quite contemporary fiction, it's kind of like an amalgamation of all three of those. I loved it. And then we have Not My Problem by Kira Smith. This is another YA sapphic fiction book, but this doesn't feel YA. I really enjoyed this, I didn't roll my eyes once. I felt like even at 28 years old, I could really relate to and enjoy this book. Again, this is about, what's her name, Ideen. Ideen, Aideen? Aideen. I pronounce it as Ideen in my head when I was reading it, but maybe it's Aideen. Let's just Google it. Nope, all that is coming up is the pronunciation of Aiden, and I know that one. Um, I'm going to say Ideen. So you've got Ideen, she's a bit of a rule breaker, she lives alone with her single mother who is an alcoholic and she isn't very good at school, she's always finding herself getting in trouble and she just wants to make other people happy and she like is very much a rule breaker, very much a troublemaker but there's something just really endearing about her. So Aideen, Aideen, I can't remember what I said I was going to say now. So Aideen kind of has like an enemy type thing. It's like an enemy to lovers, but like a very soft enemy to lovers. She basically doesn't really get on with this girl called Maeve who's in her class and Maeve is like the geek, the swat, like the teacher's pet, all of that. And then one day Aideen walks in on Maeve basically having a breakdown. She can't cope with all the pressure that's on her and Aideen suddenly sees her in a completely different light and realises that she's just a human. She's dealing with different problems than Aideen's suffering with, but they're problems nonetheless. And Aideen goes out on a mission to fix Maeve's problems and in the process ends up fixing loads of other people's problems as well, but always in exchange for a favour. And as you can guess, a romance blossoms between Aideen and Maeve because of course it does. Again, like I was saying with, which book was I saying with? Oh, Written in the Stars. 
there's no like existential trauma there's no like coming out trauma it's just Aideen is gay Maeve is gay and they like each other and there's another storyline around that which I really really enjoyed I never ever find myself laughing out loud at books like even if a book's funny the most you're gonna get from it is like a little smile this book literally had me laughing out loud at some point Aideen is so funny she's so sarcastic and I feel like I just got her humour so much. Like, she reminded me of a lot of, like, girls I went to school with. A lot of, like, my own humour I could see in her. I thought she was really, really funny. The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. I see a lot of controversy around this book online. Like, some people really, really hate it. But other people really, really love it. And I must say, I'm in the love it camp. I really enjoyed this book. So the main character in this is Nora and her whole life has basically come crashing down around her. She's really struggling to get up in the mornings, everything's going wrong and so she decides to end her own life. Only after she does so she finds herself in a place called Midnight Library which is basically this massive like fantastical library full of all these books and each book is a different life that Nora could have lived. So when in the Midnight Library, Nora gets to voice some of the regrets she's had in life, some of the regrets that have led her to where she is today. And so she gets to live her life, live these different versions of her life as if those regrets had never happened. But in each one, something goes wrong, something still makes her unhappy. She sort of comes to realise that every action has a consequence, whether that's positive or negative, and the butterfly effect is very much a real thing. She might have this big regret about something that she did 10 years ago, but had she made the other choice? Maybe something worse would have happened, or maybe her life would have been better, there's no way of knowing. But everything is this butterfly effect. I personally never had suicidal thoughts, but I've struggled a lot with mental health throughout my life. I have had anxiety since I was diagnosed when I was like three years old. I am so certain I have a big touch of OCD as well. I wouldn't say I necessarily have depression, but I very much have like depressed periods, which I think are more linked to my anxiety and OCD than actual depression. Um, and I found myself in one of those sort of depressed periods a lot recently and I've actually recently found out that when you make like big life changes, so I recently bought a house and after I bought the house I was obviously happy and excited but I suddenly found myself at a dead end because I was like that's it, like this is what I've spent the last 10 years of my life like aiming for and saving up for and now I've done it, I was like what do I do now, like I've always wanted to be in a happy relationship, I am, what do I do now, I've wanted pets, I've got my pets, what do I do now? And I found myself at a point where I should have been really, really happy, but I was just struggling with like regrets and things that I should have done when I was younger and like feeling trapped. And it was just a really like horrible hole to dig myself out of. And then I read this book and suddenly my entire thought process just flipped on its head. And I've been feeling a lot more positive about it ever since. There's a little therapy session. Didn't think I was going to get that out in this video, but there we go. This book could have been deeper, don't get me wrong. Like it could have delved a lot more into some of the themes, but... It was good for what it was, I really liked it. Then we have The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. If you're a fan of The Silent Patient, if you like Alex Michaelides' writing, then you will also love this one because I actually like this one more than I like The Silent Patient. Um, this is very much a dark academia murder mystery. It is set at Cambridge University. It's got, who's the main character? What's she called? Mariana. So Mariana is a therapist and she gets a call from her niece saying that her niece's best friend has been found murdered can mariana come and like help the situation and just like be with her niece and mariana agrees obviously to go but it brings back a lot of horrible feelings for her because her husband was actually found dead on a beach he drowned not too long before this and so she's dealing with a lot of ptsd from that literally in the first chapter the first page even maybe of this book you are told who the main suspect in this is so mariana like i said is a therapist and she goes in and her immediate sort of like instinct is to fix things so she comes up with her main suspect and she is on a mission to prove that this arguably not arguably very much is a very creepy man is the one responsible for these murders and she is not gonna get, let it go she is like a dog with a bone and the entire book is basically Mariana trying to like convince you as the reader almost that this man is the one responsible but there's many reasons as to why that might not be true and um, this has a lot of references to Greek mythology, which I found really interesting. I've never really been into Greek mythology too much, but really weirdly, I've read so many books recently that reference Greek mythology and I'm actually getting really into it. So maybe that's a theme I need to sort of delve into more. But yeah, the twist, the twist at the end of this one, because of course there's a twist, it's a murder mystery, psychological thriller, there's gonna be a twist. It's really good. I did not guess. I didn't guess it at all. 
also I saw a lot of criticism before I read this book that a lot of people said it was like overly academic that it made them feel a bit stupid I didn't get that from it at all like I hate books that sort of like are condescending and they sort of talk down to you as a reader this is very academic but I don't think it's condescending at all I think it's actually really really interesting Where the Cruel Dad Sing by Delia Owens I wasn't going to read this one and my best friend was like read it so we can go see the movie together so I was like okay I'll read it so I read it still haven't seen the movie we need to organize that um, and I thought it was very much okay. I gave this a 3.5 stars. I enjoyed it for what it is, but I feel like I would have enjoyed it more if it wasn't such a split story. So basically this is a story of Kaya who was basically abandoned by her entire family by the time she was 10 years old. And she raised herself living in the marshes of North Carolina. And she was very much an outcast from society. Like all the people in the town called her marsh girl. Don't go near her, don't socialize with her, she's weird. So Kai very much like raised herself and she did make some friendships and some relationships over the years but she was very much a loner and then one day a sort of like popular jock from the town is found dead having been pushed off this tower and the marsh girl Kaya is the number one suspect. So the chapters in this kind of switch between the murder investigation into Chase Andrews death and then Kaya's story so it starts when she's literally like six years old and it tells her story kind of year by year up until she's standing on trial for Chase's murder when she's in her late 20s, I think, maybe 26, 27 years old. And then even after that, it follows her all the way up to her death when she's an old lady. And I, I enjoyed both aspects of the story, but I feel like I would have enjoyed them more if they were both entirely separate. Like the murder mystery was really really good and I also quite enjoyed the sort of like marsh girl upbringing side of the story but I feel like that could have been expanded on more and I don't want to give away any spoilers as to what like Kaya's life becomes as she gets older but some of it's a bit unrealistic but it didn't need to be unrealistic if Dee Owen spent longer explaining these things if that makes sense it's really hard to say what I'm trying to say without spoiling it <laughs> like I think if it focused on just one of the storylines it would have been able to go a lot deeper but I did enjoy it for what it is I must say also I really enjoyed seeing Kaya's interactions with the people around her because she was very like unsocialized she didn't know how to socialize with people so it's really interesting seeing her like as she grew older and grew more educated how her interactions with the people around her changed I thought it was really really clever and that's important because for so much of the book especially like the first maybe third maybe even half of the book Kaya's on her own it's literally just her in a marsh on her own learning how to survive so there isn't any speech and it's very descriptive and there's a lot of like Kaya's thoughts which some people might really like but I'm not really into descriptive writing and I really want that plot I want that like development to keep me turning the pages and then finally we have Carrie Soto is back by Taylor Jenkins Reid I had this on pre-order I was so excited to read this book it is no surprise that I'm a big fan of Taylor Jenkins Reid and her whole Hollywood universe Carrie Soto is no exception. I loved this book. I love this character. I gave it four and a half stars. Just so immersive. Like Taylor Jenkins Reid has such a way of like pulling you into this world that she's created. So if you don't know, four of Taylor Jenkins Reid's books. So Carrie Soto is back, Malibu Rising, Daisy Jones and the Six, and The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo are all set in the same universe. Like all of the characters sort of like interact with each other. So Carrie Soto is mentioned very briefly in Malibu Rising as the person that the main character's husband cheats on her with. Um, so in that book there was nothing about it that I was like oh I want to learn more about Carrie Soto, like I really care about this character. And then this came out and now Carrie Soto is everything to me. I love her. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie it did take me a moment to get into it because Carrie Soto is a tennis player and tennis is her whole life. And I can't say I've ever really cared about tennis. Like I read this whole book, I devoured it. Could I tell you how tennis is scored still? Absolutely not, not a clue. So the first like maybe quarter of this book is a lot of like teaching the reader about tennis. If you don't really care about tennis, then you're not really gonna care about the first quarter of this book. But believe me, just keep fighting through. Like once you're through the first quarter and you've sort of like really learned who these characters are and what the storyline is, you'll fall in love like I did. Like when I was reading this first quarter, I was like, this is, Taylor Jenkins Reid's worst book, book. I was like I don't actually like this I was devastated but fight through it's worth it so Carrie Soto is the best tennis player in the whole world not female tennis player like she will go mad if you say that she is the best tennis player in the whole world she has the most grand slam wins out of anyone ever and then she has to retire and obviously 
she's living her retirement quite happily until around the mid-90s when another tennis player called Nikki Chan suddenly takes over Carrie's title and Carrie is not happy about it or like she draws with Carrie's title. So Carrie comes out of retirement at 37 years old and goes public saying I'm coming out of retirement to beat Nikki Chan and to take my title back. So the bulk of this book follows Carrie at the four major tennis tournaments and I'm very upset to tell you that I now know what the four major tennis tournaments are. Wimbledon in London, Paris, New York, where's the, oh Melbourne, Australia. I didn't know that before, now I do, that's fun. Um, so Carrie is going to each of these tournaments and is basically trying to get back her crown of the most grand slams of any person ever. So you literally learn about Carrie Soto from like the day she is born. It very much is a story as much about Carrie's dad, Javier, as it is about Carrie herself. And Javier, since the day Carrie was born, has been like, you are a goddess, you were put on this earth to win, to do amazing things, you're going to be amazing. And that very much comes across in who Carrie is as a character, she is so headstrong, kind of a bit of a bitch, which is a big part of the story. Like, she's a bitch, but she owns it. She knows she's the best, she's gonna be the best, and you cannot tell her otherwise, and you can't show her otherwise. Like, she's a fundamentally flawed character, and it's very clear to see as the reader what these flaws are. And Taylor Jenkins Reid has such a good way of writing these flawed women, but you still love them so much. And Carrie's character arc throughout the book as well is so wonderful. Like, she grows so much as a character, and it's so nice to actually see that from chapter to chapter. It's not like a sudden thing at the end of the book where suddenly like things have changed and she's a different person. Like it's so gradual and I think that's such clever writing. Like this is a book about family and that father-daughter bond and that relationship they have and I could talk about this forever. I really love this book. Like now I'm wondering why I didn't give it five stars. But I think the only reason I didn't give it like a solid five stars is because for me Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo is five stars. That is five incredible. Do I think this book is as good as that? No. Hence the four and a half. And with that we have all ten books that I have read recently. If you've read any of these books then please do let me know in the comments, let me know what you thought of them, if you agree or disagree. I'm up for some debate, why not? Um, let me know if there are any other books as well that you think I should add to my to read list and I guess I'll see you in the next one. Oh and if there's any videos you want to see from me let me know, I'm still like getting my feet on this channel, like figuring out what people want to see, what they don't want to see. I'm an open book, just let me know.